The Rise of Skywalker finally came out yesterday, so today we are going to take 20 of your questions about the movie and do our best to answer them. I feel like this goes without saying, but there will be spoilers ahead. Mr. J.D. Rice and Nico Janatunin both ask about Ben resurrecting Rey. How did he do it, and why did he die? So this is just like a force healing thing that we have seen in The Mandalorian now, and of course it's in The Rise of Skywalker. Um, but I've seen a lot of people talking about like, oh, he kind of did what Anakin wanted to do. Uh, so was he rearranging metachlorians or anything like that? Why, why could Ben do it, but Anakin could not? And I think the core of that is that uh, Anakin wasn't doing it as a selfless act. It was a selfish one. Ben, I think, was going into this like, I know I'm going to die, uh, yeah. and, but I want her to live. And so he transferred his life essence over. Anakin was like, no, I have to stop Padme from dying because I want her. And George Lucas has said, like, it, it's a possessive love. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't coming from a selfless place. It was selfish. Yeah. Earlier in the movie, Ray explains to BB-8 the process of force healing. And it's like, I give a little bit of my life force over to heal whatever it is that needs to be healed and for a dead person it seems like it would take a lot of life force to <laughs> fix that so in the most simplest terms it's just it took his entire life force to save her yeah i did like that theme it was ongoing throughout the movie i liked that uh, bb8 did the same thing to dio where like she was explaining the whole process to BB-8 and then he saw Dio and he charged his battery with mm -hmm. some of his own power. I thought that was pretty nice. But yeah, I, I while I don't like that Ben Solo died only because I, I loved the character so much when he finally turned, he was so much fun. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that that's a pretty nice parallel to see uh, that you can cheat death with the Force, but... It's there's, like a light side power. There's consequences. Oh, yeah, there's consequences, <laughs> but it's like uh, I'm doing this selflessly, whereas my grandfather was doing it for the wrong reasons. Spudge Stew wants to know how Palpatine survived. Well, welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah, so this is one of those questions where it's like, we don't know. The answer is, we don't know. Uh, I tried to pick questions that we actually could answer, but so many people asked about this that, I mean, we have to talk about it. I don't think even JJ knows. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that. Huh. I'm still waiting on the visual dictionary to get here, and maybe <laughs> it'll say something. But, like, they briefly talked about on the Resistance base planet, like, uh, they mentioned clones and Sith magic, and, like, oh my gosh, is all of this really happening? And it just felt very, like hand wavy so i don't know he could have had like he did in legends clones where his spirit transferred over or i got this weird sense like is exegol like the sith afterlife do all sith go there when they die i just i don't know <laughs> it could be maybe not like an afterlife but uh what's the not heaven or hell what's the purgatory like, yeah it's like a weird sith purgatory place where he can't leave unless he gets ray there and like transfers his essence and whatnot um but i don't know do you do we want to like wildly speculate because here's something that you brought up yesterday for him to have had a child and then for him to have sent people to go get ray he, like, wasn't gone for that long. <laughs> yeah, he had... So Ray was five, I think, when people came after her and her parents left her on Jakku. And, like, that had to have happened not super long after Return of the Jedi. Like, Palpatine couldn't have been... It's not like he just came back. Yeah. He's, he's been there for a minute. Which, which I mean makes sense because he says i made snoke i've been you know pulling the strings this whole time um and yeah maybe it's just taken him this long using whatever sith magic to 
to <laughs> become this like weird zombie version of himself that doesn't have fingertips. Yeah, I, we're gonna get the visual dictionary and it'll like provide an answer and I'll feel real dumb, but I'm st just waiting on the delivery. Should have just gone out to a bookstore and got off my lazy bum. <laughs> Pietro Pietro asks if it should have been Anakin and not Han talking to Kylo in that one scene, like on the Death Star wreckage with right. all the water. Yeah, uh, no, like I will defend that scene uh, with my dying breath, I will give it my life essence <laughs> if it means it can survive. Uh, that would have been that would have been really weird and awkward because they've never met. Yeah, like I kind of I understand the reasoning because he's been talking to his grandfather, which I guess was Palpatine. That's never made super clear, but he's like, "Show me again the power of the dark side." Well, he's been and, like, talking to Darth Vader as right. his grandfather. He doesn't know Anakin. Yeah, but like that's why I get kind of the desire to see actually Anakin come in and be like, look, kid, like, here's where I messed up and where you can make things right and turn it around. I get that. But Han is his father mm -hmm. and it's his greatest sin. Like, that's what he's been dealing with since The Force Awakens. It's the biggest mistake he's ever made. Killing his father. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking even at the the Rise of Kylo Ren comic that just came out, we see that, yeah, he, the stuff in the hut happened, but I don't blame him for defending himself. Even if Luke had no intention of going after him, like his mind had been warped by Snoke, he's scared. Mm -hmm. He, I don't think he blew up the temple and killed all the other students. It's just like he got chased away. He got chased into Snoke's arms. Han was his first actual like that's not really true it's the first <laughs> sacrifice that we have seen he's already done some terrible things in the name of the first order but this is like the personal kill and it was one of the things that he was saying like this is going to help me fully c go to the dark side like killing yeah. my father so the fact that he did it and, and it didn't <laughs> yeah and an another thing about if we had had Anakin in that scene, that would have been a much longer scene because I feel like Anakin would have had to have a lot to say to Kylo. I don't, like, I mean, we, we got Anakin a little bit and he had a little bit to say. So, <laughs> like, I think they probably could have done something similar. But, I mean, what you just said resonated with me. Like, yeah, that's the thing that he thought would put him over into the dark side and then revisiting that is what actually brings him to the light. That's a really nice parallel. Mm -hmm. But just seeing his father, even if it was all just in his head, kind of him working through this stuff on his own, seeing his dad be like, no, you have the strength to do what's right. And then he does it. And we get all that parallel. I, I thought all of that was really, really well done. So I would, I would keep Han and I, I would love to have seen Hayden Christensen on screen just somewhere else. I did have the speculation that maybe that scene was meant for Leia, uh, that she was going to force project herself there to talk to Ben face to face. Or and, even travel there. Or, or travel there, yeah, because we know that if we still had Carrie Fisher around, she would have had a lot more to do in the film. So part of me wondered if that part were meant for her, but... Like you said, I really like that we get to see a lot of those same lines from The Force Awakens when he does kill his dad and he makes all the right choices. Mm -hmm. I absolutely think that you're probably right. I think Leia would have had a lot more to do with Ben coming back uh, if Carrie were still with us. The S.E.K. wants to know if Ahsoka is dead. Because we did hear her voice there at the end when all the... Jedi voices are ringing around and, and Rey's head. Mm -hmm. Like, we're literally inside you. <laughs> yeah, although Ahsoka is no Jedi mm. by her own admission. Yeah. But uh, still glad they included her. And I would guess, yes, she would be 71 at this time. Uh, that's not crazy old, but like, it's old enough, I think. I think that's the implication. Um, there's still plenty of room for her to have more adventures and hopefully she dies peacefully in her bed surrounded by loved ones. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, 
I don't know. There's also the possibility that she was just like transmitting her voice to Rey, like Yoda did that in Star Wars Rebels. I was about to say, I mean, she's vaguely familiar with the world between worlds. I don't think it's impossible for her to hear this this call for help and like put her two cents in. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think she absolutely has to be dead, but since everyone else in that scene is, I think that's the most likely case. Mm-hmm. Aiden Moore asks why Ray created a goldish or yellow or orange lightsaber rather than a blue or green one. We're not super sure like which color it is exactly. I thought it was orange, I, like I, a pale orange. Yeah, I first thought orange, but gold is fine too. Um, I think that the implication there is that I mean, we all kind of were wondering that maybe Ray would start the Skywalker order. And that's what the rise of Skywalker meant, something like that. Uh, but we didn't really get that. I think that this could be hinting that she is starting something a little new and a little different. Mm -hmm. It's not what we're familiar with. It's not blue or green or even purple. It's a brand new color that we've rarely seen before. We've never seen it on the big screen for sure. And yeah, I, I think that it's just her forging her own path. Whatever it is, it has to do with the dyad somehow, maybe. Well, the dyad is gone. <laughs> I don't know. We It's still like... Or the fact that a Palpatine is taking the name of a Skywalker. I don't know. No, I don't <clears throat> think it has to do with any of that. I, I think they just... <laughs> I think it just symbolizes that, like, in the end, Rey is still Rey. She's special in her own right. She has created this life for herself made all these decisions to point her in the right direction. She does take the name Skywalker, but she doesn't succumb to her fate as a Palpatine. So yeah, give her a new color. Yeah. I mean, she buries the two legacy lightsabers uh, and she makes her own. And I do think that's important. CFC Tom wants to know how we felt about Hux being killed off so quickly. Uh, a little bummed for Domhnall Gleeson. <laughs> I, I enjoyed the character. Yeah, well, first of all, for me, it was a little bit jarring to know that he was the spy. I could, I mean, I kind of saw it coming. I was like, okay, it's either Hux or the new guy, which <laughs> I was like, oh, maybe it's the new guy. But no, it was Hux. And I was surprised that he got killed so quickly, but I'm okay with it because of what he says when Finn shoots him. And Finn asks, like, why are you helping us? And he, like, sneers and is like, I'm not helping you. I don't care what happens to you. I just want Kylo to fail. And, like, that's been his shtick this yeah. entire time. No, I'm and not so, helping you. I'm hurting him. <laughs> yeah. So the fact that he dies quickly, I was like, okay, well, he's... He, he did as much as he could, I guess, for... I was interested to hear, I don't know, more about, like, his motivations, where he was going to go. I, I thought that that would be a fun plot line. Uh, but, yeah, then Pride just offs him immediately, and that's... I don't know. It starts off with, like, there's a spy in the First Order, and it feels like it's going to be this big thing, and it's just kind of swept under the rug. Mm -hmm. But I understand it because, like, the person in charge of the First Order eventually needed to be an ex-imperial it yeah. needed to be someone uh, a member of the old guard and so i get why the decision was made it just it did feel uh a little abrupt it it also kind of made pride's character i don't know seem more important smarter like just like a, a better leader just because he was like well i know who the spy is now like, he is not messing around. Matthew Grabowski asks what we think about Ray using Force Lightning by accident. I liked it. I mean, it was unexpected, uh, but it made sense. They were just in this tug of war and that it's kind of in her blood that she would tap into the dark side, mm. uh, not on purpose, but just as she was trying to bring out more and more power, that's just where she went. It, it was a big shock to me. Like, I think I uh, literally gasped. Oh, I did one of these. <laughs> like a silent gasp. Yeah. Cl clutch your clutch pearls. Clutch my pearls. 
Um, and at first I was like, uh, like I was really shaken up. Like, what does this mean? Oh no, <laughs> I don't know how to feel. But then I was like, okay, yeah, that was kind of cool because in that whole scene, it's kind of mirroring the scene in the last Jedi where they're doing the whole tug of war thing for the lightsaber. She's trying to literally pull this ship down from the sky to save Chewie because she thinks Chewie's on the ship and Kylo's there doing the opposite. And you can just see the look in her eyes and her face. She's getting angrier and angrier and tapping into some really dark stuff. And yeah, her lineage kind of starts to show. <laughs> And I like the little touch at the very end of that scene where you can kind of hear her fingertips sizzle. Oh, I think I missed that. <laughs> Inthert wants to know if Luke's death carried any weight in the rest of the galaxy. I imagine that it did. I mean, that's really the only thing that changed between Crate and now. And people were curious, like, is anyone going to care at this point? In my head, yes, I want that to have mattered, mm -hmm. and I think that it did, but they really didn't make it clear <laughs> in the movie. Like, I feel like there could have been some communication uh, that Luke helped restore some hope. Yeah. I think this all comes down to the end of The Last Jedi and what the kids are talking about when they're describing what happened on crate and they're they're talking about him as if maybe he survived like maybe the galaxy doesn't think he's dead maybe they're still imagining him as this legend that is may or may not be around and people are just going to continue to tell these stories about him i, I don't i don't maybe but i i don't think that it's a secret that he died uh like resistance reborn doesn't act like it's a secret so well people that knew him sure yeah I, I think that the point was that they see that luke sacrificed himself to save the resistance and like that they, the resistance was worth saving mm -hmm. it was worth that big of a sacrifice and then that would help restore hope uh but that's just not touched upon in the movie itself it's just like well let's just put out another signal and cross our fingers that people show up this time. Yeah. I, I feel like it could have been addressed. Like someone could have screamed for Skywalker or something. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I'm going to have my own headcanon that the big difference was that uh, Luke's death inspired people. His his death itself, yeah, I'm, I'm a little conflicted on whether or not that had an impact, I guess. When you really boil it down, what was impactful is that he gave Ray his ship and she was able to tell the Resistance where to go with it. Ari Paver asks, what we think of Ray calling herself a Skywalker? Yeah, I, I liked it. It, it. I definitely saw it coming the second the old woman was like, what's your name? I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was something that we had kind of thought about happening a while ago like we were just speculating on the title of rise of skywalker and what that meant and then we were we got it down to okay it's about ben solo being a skywalker or skywalker is going to be the name of the new jedi or ray's going to take the name skywalker so does she deserve it sure <laughs> yeah i don't really have a problem with it uh it, it also just didn't really excite me I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm i just a big fan of, like, Ray as nobody. Yeah. So I wasn't into Ray Palpatine for sure. Her taking on the name is like, okay, but I would have maybe liked it better if she was just like, I'm Ray, and that's all that I need to be. I and mean, the fact that she was taught by both Luke and Leia, I think that in itself kind of, allows her to deserve to take the name maybe like yeah i mean for sure it's i have no question about does she deserve it is she worthy of the name i'm fine with all that uh it's she more can't about, go around saying palpatine right 
That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what's your name? Ray Hitler. Uh, mm. <laughs> so, yeah, them, their force ghosts being there, like, they're basically nodding their approval. And, like, yeah, they are who made her, even though she only spent, like, a day with Luke. Mm. But, like, that's the, they are her family, her found family, and it's not Palpatine. Uh, so it, it's a fine message. I just think I prefer it to the, it doesn't matter what your last name is. You can be great no matter what. Robin Dahlstrom wants to know if Snoke was a failed clone of Palpatine or just a puppet created by him. I think just a puppet. And that was another thing where I was like, he goes, I created Snoke. And I was like, oh, like figuratively. Yeah, <laughs> you made him who he is. The, oh, no. There's like a literal vat of Snokes just sitting around. And Which I was like, is so bizarre. But yeah, I don't know. I don't think he was a planned clone of Palpatine or else no. he would have, I don't know. I think Puppet is more likely. Yeah. I, I like to think that Palpatine's was really bad at whatever he was doing to create Snoke because that's why he looked so terrible and scary. That's uh, Mr. Sunday Movies was speculating that Snoke looked like that because he was kind of a vessel for Palpatine's evil and that he, he would degrade. Hmm. But like all the clones looked messed up like that already. So Palpatine's just bad at making people. Yeah, which it makes sense if you're trying to... The dark side would warp whatever creation you make. <laughs> Jane Dalton asks who all the people in the arena on Exegol were and who crewed all the Star Destroyers in that massive new fleet. Right. So I believe they are just like Sith worshippers. There was one line, I think, in the big like First Order conference room uh, where someone said like, I don't know about this. They seem like a bunch of cultists. So I think that Exegol has a population they probably all just worship the Sith. Mm -hmm. It's still unclear, but then my guess would be that they also crew the Star Destroyers. Oh, I didn't put that together. I think that, the, that's the only thing that makes sense to me. I feel like there was enough First Order people to be sent out and to crew those. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> it's unclear, but. A lot of this is unclear. Right. It makes sense to me that... And, like, the, the Sith Troopers come out of nowhere, and they're only on Exegol, so I'm going to guess that the Sith Troopers are all not from the First Order. They're part of the Final Order. Yeah, we talked about this a little last night with our friends uh, right after seeing the movie, and my guess was that they were just people who were, like, not strong in the Force, but somehow possessed by the dark side and helping the Sith. Cause like we see a few of them in the first scene and then like their faces are all wrapped up and it's very dark and ominous, but there are a lot of them. And it's crazy to me that they're all just like hanging out there. What have they been doing? Have they just been watching Palpatine? Uh, what do they eat? What? <laughs> it's all just so unclear. Like for a while I was like, are these Sith ghosts? Yeah. Like, are these all the undead Sith who live in Palpatine? And I don't think that is the case, but I was sitting there trying to figure it out myself. Where's that visual dictionary? <laughs> Bayou Jesse wants to know what will keep Sidious from rising yet again. Well, hopefully, Lucasfilm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very good. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the thing is we didn't get any explanation for how he came about how he survived he's just like i died once i didn't care for it like, which is which is interesting that he had a line that confirms that he had died yeah and so he came back from the dead from or, from the yeah. dead yeah <laughs> that it's like early on i was like okay i can get behind this i was trying so hard guys and i was <laughs> like okay he did die and he doesn't look great now, mm. so it's not like... He's just, like, clinging to life as hard as he can. So I was like, all right, I think I can handle this. But we don't know how. And so he dies again. He looks like he was obliterated. But, yeah, 
What's to stop him from survival? We don't know exactly how he died because we just see him fall in that fiery, the blue fiery pit of the the Death Star. Um, But this time we see him die and it's rough. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't look great, but he exploded once before (laughs) and he pieced himself back together. Is he Dr. Manhattan? Like. (laughs) Is he just going to come around every 30 years? I don't know. Maybe it, he's got a limited number of, of times that he can do that. Yeah. I guess like they also destroyed the Sith throne. Maybe that has something to do with it. I assume, like, slash hope so hard that he's gone for good now. Or maybe the the fact that Rey defeated him and, and lives now, and because of Ben Solo's sacrifice... He cannot come back. Yeah, maybe there was something about... The Force is like, no, no. (laughs) The fact that (laughs) Vader died to kill him, I don't know. I said we weren't going to pick a lot of questions where the answer was, I don't know, but here's another one. (laughs) Caleb A. Diaz asks if Finn is Force-sensitive. Yep. Yeah, I'd say so. There's a couple of lines along the, the way through the movie that kind of hint at it, but then... He said he like feels when Ray dies it, when she when she dies yeah and I wish that they had given him a little bit more to do as far as like if you're gonna say oh Finn's force sensitive I wish they had pushed that narrative a little bit more because in the film the only scenes we see him where we're like oh Finn is force sensitive is for Ray's sake. Yeah. To tell us about what's happening with Ray. Yeah. So. And also it felt a little like a reaction. Like they, they kind of did a fake out in all the Force Awakens marketing. He was the one with the lightsaber and people were excited that he would get to be Force sensitive. And then they're like, nope. And now it's like, oh, never mind. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I feel like there could have been more build up to that in The Force Awakens or The Last Jedi. Uh, but. What what would have been nice is if he were on Tatooine at the end. Like, yeah. Ray's going to train him. Mm-hmm. I don't know to what degree he is force sensitive because there are like, uh, Jen Erso's mother was force sensitive and and that she could feel the force but she couldn't use it or control it. Maz Kanata. She can use the force, uh, but she's not a Jedi. Like, this the, like there's just different degrees. Mm-hmm. And so Finn could be someone who just feels the force and can follow its path like he has those instincts yeah uh he might not be able to control it but i hope that he could and it would have been cool to see him like be with ray as part of her found family at the end on tatooine instead of her just being there alone yeah. like she started the force awakens alone in a desert <laughs> it's a little similar to what we see as far as Force sensitivity goes with Leia in The Force Awakens. We see her reacting to things that are happening because she's connected to the Force. But at the time of The Force Awakenings, we don't know that Luke actually trained her. We don't find that out until this movie. Um, and Which she, was a great touch. I liked it. Yeah, and we don't know that she can fly through space. So it, it kind of reminded me a little bit of that. Just like, oh, I can feel things and connect with people so i do like the idea of ray training finn in my head canon that's what's going to happen alex brennan wants to know if all this new stuff about palpatine and snoke contradicts the story told in aftermath about the dark presence in the unknown regions i don't think so because uh i haven't read aftermath in a while but from what i can recall uh palpatine felt something in the unknown regions calling to him and we all kind of assumed Ooh, Snoke, because he's the new big thing. He's the new hot thing in Star Wars. Uh, So we thought that a stronger uh, dark side being was calling to Palpatine. I think that now we can say that that was Exegol. And I think that, yeah, it even says, like, the source of the dark side or the source of the Sith is in the Unknown Regions. That's Exegol. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Brian Beatty, Drakerthan101, and Michael Claridge all asked why there wasn't a missing S-foil on Luke's X-Wing. I wasn't surprised. I was not expecting this question to get so many 
uh, asks, but <laughs> uh, it popped up a lot. And so the thing is, Luke's hut on Octo used one of the wings as his door, and then he pulls the X-wing out, and Ray flies away. I will assume that there's just an off-screen moment where she takes the door and puts it back on the X-wing, like it's fine. Uh, but Michael Claridge also asks, like, what is the relationship between the Lucasfilm Story Group and the creator? Because I would say that there were a lot of contradictions in this movie. Not big, huge things. It's stuff like The Door. It's stuff like Poe's backstory not lining up with the comics. It's stuff that most moviegoers will not ever catch or care about. But it sounds like things that the story group should have been like, mm, can't do that because of this. And I do not know how this movie was made or developed. I mentioned this in the review, though, and I really feel like J.J. just went off on his own, wrote his own thing, and didn't care about what anyone else said. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it seems like he had an idea about how he wanted this story to go from maybe the beginning from The Force Awakens. And he went through with it despite any inconsistencies that he ran into. Yeah. I mean, I think the relationship between story group and creator depends on the creator. I think that it's up to the creator, and we know that Ryan Johnson worked with the story group closely. Like, that's in the uh, the director and the Jedi documentary that comes with the last jedi and like i've talked to a lot of authors and they talk about collaborating with the story group and it seems like they're a resource to be mined and used and i don't think jj used them i mean i think he he got some fun little easter eggs in there uh all the voices like i don't think he was like we need to get ahsoka and kane and jarris no <laughs> i think the story group was probably like it would be really nice if these jedi were included but I feel like there were things where he's like, I want Poe to have been a spice runner. And then he left to join the resistance. And I don't care that the comics say that he was in the new Republic Navy right before. <laughs> like I just, I'm sensing a lot of that in this movie. Yeah. But you know, at the same time, I know you already said this, but it is nitpicking. It's just little things that any, director has the right to change if they feel the need to um and yeah it's it's it is what it is it's tough <laughs> because yeah he well he i do think that jj deserves to tell his story but it's like if you want to play in star wars should you not respect what came before and a lot of people will say the same thing about last jedi totally fair like <laughs> i i I see where that's coming from, uh, but that's that's how I'm feeling about this one. Andrew and Augustus Sforza both want to know how we feel about getting a Force Ghost conference call instead of a Force Ghost con. I wanted to include these questions because I love just the term Force Ghost conference call. We got into the like, Force Skype, now we get a conference call. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. Like, there were a couple things where I was like, I had these predictions uh, we'd get like a, a big cameo fest with a bunch of different people. We got Wedge. Uh, we'd get uh, the Stormtrooper Revolt, and we got some other Stormtroopers that defected. Uh, a lot of things that it was like, well, we got halfway there. Mm -hmm. And the conference call, uh, <laughs> it, it went above and beyond for me. Like, I wanted to see all the Force ghosts, and instead we didn't get to see any except for Luke and Leia, but we did get to hear way more than I ever would have guessed. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated that. Yeah, that scene, like, I literally thought it was going to pan up and all those voice people were going to be standing there. But, you know, I'm happy with what we got. So that that's a tough, that would have been a tough spot for me because I, the, the force ghosts and how they work is still so up in the air. So, like, if Mace Windu and Kiati Mundi and Adi Galea were all there as force ghosts, I would have been like, uh, mm, that doesn't really work. Well, like, I guess, I mean, if it had just been the voices of the people that we know are Force Ghosts or would be 
become forest ghosts than I would have expected to see those people. Um, at least some of them. I, I agree. And again, like I'm being nitpicky where I'm like, I know the rules and <laughs> pe the general audience would just be like, look at all those forest ghosts. That's awesome. And usually, and in this case, I think I would have accepted like, yeah, let's go for the cool thing over the, what the rules are. Like you don't have to follow the rules to the letter. <laughs> like, sure. Let Mace Windu show back up as a force ghost. Mm -hmm. It would have been really neat to see them all back there. I think that would have been very powerful. And yeah, I, I wish they did that rather than uh, not including any of them at all. The thing that I enjoyed most about that part is the callback to the beginning where we first see her meditating and she's chanting, be with me, be with, be with me. And that happens like they're all with her they're all like using their essence to help her i don't know yeah it's again it's just it's, it's vague what's actually happening <laughs> yeah it's very vague but and i it, liked the callback um yeah that so was that. a super is very well set up and i think it would have been a little more clear if all the ghosts were behind her like with their hands up helping her doing mm -hmm. something like that yeah Matthew Grabowski asks if this trilogy should have been planned out beforehand. Yes. Yep. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's I, very I... it's very apparent that it wasn't now that we're here at the end of the the saga or at least the the sequel trilogy. Uh yeah. yeah. And I'm like it can work. The original trilogy shows that it can work. Even those movies are up and down too, but overall it had George Lucas's singular vision. And that's what I see the sequel trilogy lacking. And I wanted to wait until this movie to cast my judgment on that because I was like, The Last Jedi made some questionable decisions in my opinion, but I saw where Ryan Johnson took the building blocks and added more. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, this was like The Empire Strikes Back, the more personal story. And then the rise of skywalker will be the satisfying conclusion and that didn't feel like building on top of the last two movies it felt like building adjacent to it <laughs> diagonally or something where jj's like that's just i feel like they weren't cooperating yeah. as much as they say they were <laughs> i don't feel it i i feel like there was just this sense of tug of war between the Kylo and Rey's story and everyone else's story and then the story as a whole and like what it means and a lot of people are asking the question like what did the sequel trilogy mean after seeing I'm asking that after seeing the rise of Skywalker because there's so many questions that are unanswered um and some that got answered and that a lot of people are excited about but yeah I would definitely agree with that statement. Yeah, this is something that I've gone back and forth <laughs> on because I'm like, again, the original trilogy shows that it can work. And I wanted to believe that there was some sort of outline or plan and that it would all become apparent uh, at the end of the third movie. But now, yeah, I think that it's become apparent that there was no plan. And just because it can work doesn't mean that that's the right way to go, especially when we're in like an MCU world now. The MCU is like the gold standard of entertainment right now. And I don't think that Star Wars should follow that model to the letter, but people do expect this very serialized storytelling that builds and builds and builds to a really satisfying conclusion. And I did not feel that with The Rise of Skywalker. Levi Bond wants to know what we hope the novelization will add to this story. Answers. A lot. <laughs> I want a lot added to it. Um, definitely more information maybe about the crawl. The stuff <laughs> mentioned in the crawl, maybe we'll get a chapter that kind of flushes that stuff out. And add, also... add a good six paragraphs to the crawl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and also some stuff about the Jedi and the Sith that Palpatine talks about. Uh, there were a lot of unanswered questions there and the Force dyad, all that stuff I want to mm. know more about. See, I think that the novelization has a really good chance to clarify some things with, uh, yeah, the Emperor's return, 
that'll go a long way for me if they can tell us how, why, what's going to stop him from coming back the next time. Mm. Uh, and I think that uh, Ray Carson, A, is a good writer. I liked her work on uh, Most Wanted, and she wrote one of my favorite stories in From a Certain Point of View. And she is probably going to collaborate with the story group, and they can together make some sense of some of this. Yeah, but at the same time, I'm not getting my hopes up because I don't want to put too much pressure on her to fill in all these gaps. So I'm not going into it expecting to get all my questions answered. I I hope that, yeah, I hope that it gives me uh, some extra appreciation for episode nine. I'm not expecting it to solve all the issues that I had with it. Thomas Muis and Alex Collins ask what we hope to see in post The Rise of Skywalker content. I have uh, two things. I'll start with one. Uh, Ray training, maybe Finn or anyone else. Like, I want to see where Ray goes, uh, what she does, what's her plan. The adventures of Lando and Janna. Yeah. They set that up pretty well. I liked that. It, at first, I was like, oh gosh, I was afraid they were going to say they were from the same place and be like, wait, you're my daughter. Like the last (laughs) second, I was like, oh gosh. Uh, The other thing that I would like to see is Luke and Leia, their adventures. Like we know that they trained now. I think it would be really fun to follow them on a couple of uh, adventures throughout the galaxy. Yeah, I would definitely like to see more stuff about the training of Leia by Luke. I thought that that set up a good entrance for i don't know a a comic series something something small maybe but ultimately baby yoda (laughs) sith empire wants to know if people will warm up to this movie as time goes on absolutely yep it's the same thing people were disappointed with return of the jedi when it came out and people love it now and it's just personally Not going to ever be probably in my top favorite Star Wars movies, but there are people right now who are enthusiastically loving this movie. So, like, I'm not over here pretending that my opinion is the majority. I don't know. Uh, It's just how I feel. And so already people love it. And the kids that just saw it that are being introduced to Star Wars in the sequel trilogy they're going to champion this movie hard Mm -hmm. as they grow up. Yeah, when I first saw Solo, I wasn't crazy about it at all, but the more times I watched it, I definitely warmed up to it, and it has some of my favorite characters in it, like L3. Um, So, yeah, the more times you see a movie, you're either going to warm up to it or maybe hate it even more. I don't know. There are definitely people out there that are going to just continue to dislike it which is fine um but yeah i i'm happy about all the people that out there that loved it and we're definitely going to go see it again yeah i i'm looking forward to another viewing where some of these things that just hit me really hard i'm expecting them now and so i'll be able to just sit back and enjoy the things that i really liked even more I mean, when we did our hour-long discussion on Patreon last night, we were just running through things and going like, oh, yeah, that was fun, and that was fun, and I liked this, and I liked that. Mm -hmm. And it's just there were a couple of story decisions that uh, didn't sit well with me, and they're at the forefront of my mind right now. (laughs) But ultimately, I think I'm going to look back at this movie like I look back at all Star Wars movies, and like if I look at Attack of the Clones, I'm like, man, Battle of Geonosis is awesome. Yeah. The chase through the asteroid field, so cool. It's the same thing. I'm going to look back at this and be like, Babu Frick is my child, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll do anything for him. Yeah, I uh, I said this a couple times on Twitter, but I think we were just a bit shell-shocked, and maybe still are a bit shell-shocked. But yeah, going into it now, knowing those big story po- points that we weren't expecting and maybe aren't so happy with, We can just kind of accept them now for what they are Mm -hmm. and celebrate the good stuff. Yeah. And I'm still excited to look into that visual dictionary. I've already seen some images and there's stuff in there that excites me. Like, 
the Sith Trooper legions are named after Sith. Like there's a Revan troop and uh, uh, Tenebris and like they're named after Sith from Star Wars Legends. And I'm like, that's super cool. <laughs> so the, there are things in there I'm going to continue to enjoy more. And I'm sure that overall, everyone that has seen this movie is probably going to appreciate it more as time goes by. That's all the time we have for questions today. If you want to leave a question for next week's video, just put it in the comments below or sign up for Patreon to join our weekly Q&A discussion. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And as always, thanks for watching. May the Force be with you. And have a great holiday season.